Romans 8, 1 through 15, and the King James text today reads, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Now listen. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, meaning we owe, not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. I have a very unusual sermon title today. I want to talk to us. You'll understand as I speak. The adulterous believer. The adulterous believer. If you bow your heads with me again, Master, Savior, Redeemer, King Jesus, Lord, we love you. Lord, you know that if if I were in ministry for money, I would not be here today. If I were in ministry today to be a celebrity, I would not be here today. If I were in ministry today, Lord, for any reason less than noble, I would have quit left this thing many, many years ago. My self-esteem, my self-image in tatters, I would have walked away from it, a loser. 
someone who never realized what he hoped for, what he dreamed of, what his vision held for him. But Lord, I am in this pulpit today because at the age of eight years old, you called me to preach. At the age of 12 years old, you told me my ministry would be prophetic. And some years ago, even since I began my affirming ministry, you told me that like John the Baptist, I was going to preach from a wilderness place. Well, Lord, if I'm not in the wilderness today, I don't know where in the name of God I am. It's dry, it's desolate, spiritually it's depraved. Master, in the name of Jesus, if I'm going to do what you've called me to do, if I'm going to be able today, I am so exhausted in body and in mind today, I can, I can barely think straight. But if I'm going to deliver the word of God that you've given me, because Lord, I don't come to the sacred desk except first I've heard from heaven. I don't believe in preachers getting before God's people and delivering pretty words that they've put together, words that are born of their own imagination, of their own thinking. I come from the old school, man of God, woman of God, a preacher of the gospel, ought always to come into the pulpit with a word from heaven for the people of God, a word given him, her, them, for that moment and that time that it might meet a specific need and do a specific work. Loose today, O oh God, the anointing of your Holy Ghost. Touch my body, touch my mind, quicken in me, quicken through me the word of the living God. Touch the ear of every hearer, let our heart be prepared at this moment, O oh God, to receive that which the Spirit would speak unto the church. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. In Romans chapter 8, it is so easy for so many in the church world to go off track. The minute Paul begins to speak about being carnally minded immediately, we have preachers and teachers and theologians who begin to go off into, you know, this is those who think worldly. This is those who think, you know, the way the world thinks, the way the sinner thinks, blah, blah, blah. And they could not be more wrong. In the context of Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul is making an argument for an understanding in believers that we must always remain spiritually minded. And we are never to once again be pulled back into a thought process that is captive to the law. When Paul talks about being carnally minded, he's not talking about being sexually minded. He's not talking about being worldly minded. He's not talking about being sinful. He's talking about people who are viewing salvation and serving God through fleshly eyes still thinking that their salvation is contingent upon the works of the law. That's what he's talking about. But he made his point clear early in our passage, verse 3, for what the law, listen, could not do. He didn't say what the law 
did not do. Which would simply mean that it made its effort, but it just didn't quite hit the mark. No, no, no. He said what the law could not do. In other words, there was no possibility. Oh my God, have mercy. I wish to Jesus I had a church full of Holy Ghost filled people who can understand what I'm talking about. When God gave the law to Moses on Mount Sinai, he knew then it wasn't going to save anybody. <laughs> God had no misconception about the law whatsoever. He didn't have the thought in mind that one single soul was going to enter heaven based upon the strength of the law based upon their ability to live up to all the rules, the regulations, the edicts, and the mandates of the law of Moses. He knew that they were not going to possibly be able to live up to the requirement of the law of Moses. He knew that right off the starting line. God had no misgivings. What the law could not do. It was impossible from the start. So anybody today, especially in the New Testament era, who's fool enough to think <laughs> that to make heaven you got to live up to the edicts and mandates of the law. Honey, you're so far off base it ain't even funny. God isn't even crazy enough to believe that. What the law could not do why? In that it was weak through the flesh. Meaning what? Meaning the flesh, our ability to keep all these rules and regulations did not exist. The fact that the law required, the fact that the law depended upon man's ability to live up to all these rules and regulations, the fact that it was on us immediately rendered the law useless. What the law could not do. Why? In that it was weak through the flesh. God sent His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and condemn sin in the flesh. The only one who could ever satisfy the law in the flesh was God himself. <laughs> That's the only one. There wasn't a person on this planet. There was not a soul on this planet who could possibly satisfy the mandates and the edicts of the law. It was weak through the flesh, therefore God himself took on flesh. He was called the Son of God after the flesh, and in that flesh he condemned sin in the flesh. Now listen to what Paul said one chapter prior to Romans 8. In Romans 7, 1 through 6, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband 
is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if, while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from the law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Now listen, wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. What the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh condemns sin in the flesh. Again, Paul says, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. Listen, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. See, a lot of people, I've been talking about the issue of divorce and divorce and remarriage in our Wednesday night Bible study. And a lot of people get very uh, caught up emotionally in the subject and a lot of people begin to feel condemned and they begin to feel all these terrible bad feelings. And I try to tell people, listen, don't you go into that old mindset. Don't you get carnal on me. Don't you go back into thinking like the old man. Hello now. You got to keep a spiritual mind in your head. We're no longer under the law. We're under grace. Glory to God. We're under a whole different edict. We're under a whole different mandate. Until Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Listen to me. The law was still in full effect. The reason the Lord said the things he was saying in the Gospels concerning divorce and remarriage is because that law was yet in effect. But God uses many of these life situations to illustrate spiritual principles. And what people don't realize is the reason, Amy, that God's requirement for divorce, <laughs> oh, hallelujah, was so stringent. The reason there was only one single possible excuse for a divorce is because God uses divorce and remarriage and the laws concerning the institution of marriage to illustrate, listen to me children, his commitment to us. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. I want to shout a while. There isn't a whole lot you can do that's going to make God put you away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hallelujah. 
Oh, there isn't a whole lot you can do that will make God put you away. Glory to God. He said in the book of Jeremiah concerning backslidden Israel, he said, I'm married to her. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm married to the backslider. He said, I'm still committed to her. Oh, children, I want you to know, I don't care how far out of the way you go. I don't care how much foolishness you get involved in. I don't care how much sin you dip your toe in or how much wickedness you swim in. My God is committed to you. Hallelujah. He is married to the backslider. only one thing only one thing can make God separate himself from one that he has made a commitment to and that is if they commit adultery in the word of God in prophetic writing in the Old Testament as well as the New any reference to adultery any reference to sexual immorality or, or sexual activity intimacy outside of, of your marriage is a reference to listen to me idolatry it means that you are stepping out on your husband. You are going from God and you're getting involved with Baal. Or you're getting involved with Moloch. Or you're getting involved with some other God. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Which is why in the New Testament church, when the apostles got together and they said, Okay, we've got certain Jews among us who are giving the Gentile believers trouble and convincing them that they need to abide by all the mandates of the law as part of their Christian experience. What should we tell them? And what did the apostles come back with? They said that you abstain from meats offered unto idols. That you abstain from things strangled. That you abstain from blood. That you abstain from fornication. They were referring folks to idolatrous practices. Why? Because those are the only grounds that God will ever divorce on. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. I don't care how far away from the Lord you slide. I don't care how much wickedness you wind up involved in. Got news for you, honey. I was out of church for about three or four years when I first came out in 89 before I started my affirming ministry in 93. And, of course, the Lord brought me back into the church. But I'm going to tell you, I never ever denied my faith. I never once thought about becoming a Buddhist. I never once thought about becoming a Jew. I never once thought about converting to Islam. I never once thought about converting to another religion or serving another God or worshiping another God. No, my faith remained intact even though, listen to me, my life did not. And my marriage could always be repaired. Hallelujah. Remember what the Lord said? Once the woman, notice it was always on the woman. Once the woman has left, if she's married to another or if she's involved intimately with another and then she comes back to her first husband and they remarry he said that is an abomination to me okay I get nervous for people I'm going to be honest with you I'm going to say it plain as I can say it I get really really fearful for people like uh Tina Turner, 
who was raised in a Christian environment. And then later in life, for reasons, you know, we understand a lot of what went on in her life, but she turned from Christ and turned to Buddhism. I get, I, I, I'm not comfortable with that because I know that God is a jealous God. And the only grounds that God ever will recognize a divorce is on the grounds of adultery. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? But you see, this whole principle concerning marriage, this is why the man could be married to more than one woman, but the woman could never be married to more than one man in the Bible. See, polygamy was permitted on the part of the man, not on the part of the woman. Why is that? Well, it's easy, because the woman represents the church. But God had two wives. What? Pastor, what are you talking about? There's Israel and the church. Hallelujah. He made a commitment to Israel and according to the word of God it is an everlasting eternal commitment. Hello now. He'll never turn away from the commitment he made to Abraham. He will never turn his back on that commitment. But even as Jacob had two wives, Leah and Rebekah, God had two wives, the church and Israel. But just as Jacob favored one wife over the other, even so God favors the church. Hallelujah. Oh, children, I want you to understand me today. I want you to hear me real good. According to the Apostle Paul, he said, The law stands. A man is married to that woman, and that woman is married to that man as long as they live. He said, now, if the husband dies, then the woman is free to remarry. At that point, she's no longer bound. Because now, uh, the, the, the uh, requirement of the law has been met. What is the requirement? Till death do us part. Okay. You've met your requirement. So, Booby, got news for you. You're stuck with me till I drop dead or you won. But then Paul makes this analogy. And he says, for the church, listen, for the believer, the law was... A first husband. And he said, now the church cannot be married to Christ. Listen to me, children. If she's still married to the law. We've got pastors preaching in pulpits this Sunday all over Alabama, all over Huntsville, all over America, all around the world, trying to keep that first husband alive. They're constantly trying to revive the law. They're constantly going into the law and pulling points of the law out and trying to make those points of the law contingent upon your salvation and my salvation. But honey, let the law die, hallelujah, so that I can be married to another glory to God I tell you the Lord stands sometimes and watches some of us who so easily come under the weight of condemnation who so easily come under the weight of guilt because some preacher or some Christian tries to go back into the law and tries to once again revive the law
But our primary text today said, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh. What is Paul talking about here? Talking about walking carnally, sexually, walking as a sinner. No, 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 no. He's talking about walking after the law. What the law could not do in the flesh. Because of the weakness of the flesh. What the law could not do. In that it was weak through the flesh. When Paul said there is therefore now no, no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Who walk not after the flesh. But after the spirit. He's saying... If you get the right mindset, if you understand this way, this thing, the way y'all understand it, they can keep trying to revive the old man all they want to. They can keep trying to revive that first husband, the law, all they want to. But honey, he did to me. And he ain't never coming back. Hallelujah. I'm not ever going to let them revive that old man and bring him back into my life. Hello now. Amen. If you won't be stupid enough to revive him and bring him back into your life, you go ahead and do that. But you know what? You're like an old widow woman who can never get over the death of her first husband. If he's that wonderful... And you keep wanting to dig him up and bring him out of the grave. Oh, my first husband is so wonderful. Well, that's funny because what your first husband could not do, could not do, could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. God sent you a man who could do it. Hallelujah. But the only way you can be married to the second is you've got to let the first die. We've got too many Christians in the world today. We've got too many believers in the world today committing adultery. They're not committing adultery with Baal. They're not committing adultery with Moloch. No. Do you know who they're committing adultery with? The law. Mm -hmm. Oh my Lord, have mercy. They're not even... They're not even leaving God's house, so to speak, to commit adultery. But they keep trying to bring the first spouse back to life. And God said, no, 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 no. Uh, if you're going to walk the way of faith, if you're going to know what it is to be saved by grace through faith, you got to let the law die. And let it stay dead. Hello now. Oh, my word, have mercy. In 1 Corinthians Excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5 through 11. The Apostle Paul writes, Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit make giveth life. But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. In other words, Paul saying, if you think the law was something wonderful, Moses come down off the mountain with those tablets in his hands and his face was glowing. Having been in the presence of God, he said, but you know what? That glow eventually went away. <laughs> but listen, he said, 
But if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious. For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth, or the glory that goes even further beyond. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. Paul says, man, if you think the law came with glory, <laughs> whoo, this message of salvation by grace through faith exceeds the law in glory. Oh my gracious God, oh this, this message is so much greater. It's so much more powerful. It's so much more wonderful. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verses 5 and 6, Paul writes, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. There is a type. There's a reason he uses that imagery. Moses came down from the mountain, his face aglow. He says, but now God hath given us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Where? In the face of of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. In Hebrews 11 and 6, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. When we live our lives and our Christian experience in a constant state of fear, depression, and condemnation, we are manifesting fear, not faith. We yet embrace the notion that our salvation hinges upon our every act and our every deed. It's all on us. Our salvation is entirely upon us. But to answer for deeds done in the flesh is one thing. The Word of God said we will all stand before the Lord in judgment and we will all answer for deeds that are done in the flesh. But to be condemned for those deeds is something entirely different. The Lord has promised that those who live by faith will one day answer for all deeds done in the flesh. But by reason of the promise of God, those deeds will not condemn them. Oh my Lord have mercy. Faith understands that our God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Fear is convinced that He is only a judge and a condemner. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. Fear under, excuse me, faith understands that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Fear believes that God is only there to judge and condemn.
In Romans 3, 19 through 26, now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. The only purpose of the law was so that human beings could be humbled and they could recognize that if salvation were reliant upon their ability to live the life that they would have to live to be saved, they can't do it. That was the whole point of the law. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The law and the prophets, my friend, foretold of the righteousness that was to come by faith. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare the righteousness, his righteousness, for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. So, who's it all on? You and I? No. He said it's all on him. He achieved, he accomplished, he did what we couldn't do. He is the one who is perfect. He is the one who is righteous. He is the one who is just. But he is also now the justifier of them who live perfectly, who make no mistakes, who never fail, who never slip, who never fall. No, 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 no. Who believe on Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. It's called salvation by faith. By grace, through faith. Hallelujah. John chapter 3, verses 14 through 18. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him, listen children, is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. The church has traditionally approached the saints in an authoritarian manner spewing threats and uttering commands claiming they Speak for the Lord. Preachers are terrified if they approach the church in a manner any less heavy-handed that God's people will run wild and do anything and everything they please. 
embracing a convoluted concept of grace. But the message of the gospel is rooted in love, and it ought to be preached as such. The people of God will always be invited to draw in closer, to know the Lord better, to see Him more clearly. For in so doing, we cannot help but reflect His brightness in our conduct, in our speech, and in our living. In Matthew 26, 73 and 74, Peter denied the Lord as he stood before Pilate. And after a while came unto him they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou also art one of them, for thy speech bewrayeth thee. Then began he to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man, and immediately the cock crew. Our conduct, or as the word of God calls it, our conversation, cannot help but reflect our intimate relationship with the Lord. You see, they could tell that Peter was a person who had walked with Jesus by the way he talked. By the way he spoke, he didn't talk as rough and as tumble as others did. He didn't talk like others did. And therefore, it was like, well, wait a minute, your, your speech betrays you. Oh. Talk on it. That's the only way I can get out of this now, i got to cuss a little. i got to talk nasty for a minute because that's how I'm going to put distance between me and the Lord. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Oh, but as long as Peter was walking with Jesus, as long as he was walking with the Lord, as long as he was in close communion and close fellowship with the Lord, what happened? Jesus rubbed off on him. Hallelujah. The conduct of the Lord rubbed off on him. Peter couldn't help but act better. Peter couldn't help but be better. The church doesn't have to scare the hell out of people. That's not that's not the way we're instructed by the Word of God to shepherd the sheep. No, we don't have to scare the devil out of them. What we have to do is constantly invite them to walk in closer fellowship, in closer communion with the Lord, because the closer you get to Him, the more you begin to reflect Him, the more you begin to act like Him and resemble Him. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 23 through 31. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. 
Hallelujah. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Hebrews 4, 1 through 5, as well as verses 9 through 11. Let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor Therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fail, excuse me, any man fall after the same example of unbelief. So Paul's saying, honey, it's not about the law, it's not about the rules, it's not about the regulation, not about keeping up with all these things. He said, God's promised us rest. He let us know that there was a day coming when all these rules and regulations that we cannot possibly meet up to, we cannot live up to. He said he promised us we would have rest from the, uh, the mandate to strive after all these things. He said we'd be able to rest from this because our righteousness would come from him through faith. Lastly, 1 Corinthians 2, 11 through 16. For what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God that we might know the things, listen, that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness unto him. Well, I'll tell you, the natural man doesn't get grace. The natural man does not understand salvation by grace through faith. No, no, no. It's much easier to believe if I've broken the rules and i failed God that the only way to get right is to do right and to act right. And all of a sudden, if i, I got to keep the rules. Once I come to God, i got to start doing everything just perfect and just right. Or else I'm still going to miss heaven. And Paul said, no, no. See, mm -mm, you're not... You're not comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now you're comparing natural things. You're trying to induct the law. You're trying to revive that old man again and bring him back to life. Say, oh no, honey, let him die. Let him die. Last thing in the world you want to do is commit adultery, believer. Last thing in the world you want to do, believer, is revive that first husband so that you are living as an adulteress. 
But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. You know why people practically swallow their teeth when they listen to this preacher get up and teach like I do on Wednesday night and preach like I do every Sunday? I'll tell you why. Because they're still in a carnal mind. They're still trying to live with the law yet alive. And they cannot understand spiritual things. They don't get the principles that I'm talking about. And it makes me laugh. They hear me talk about uh, something in Bible study. I make one comment here, one comment there. And oh boy, people just jump off bridges because I make a certain comment. Do they listen to the totality of our teaching? Do they listen to the totality of our message? No. They jump immediately to a conclusion based on me saying this one little phrase here. The only problem is they don't understand. I'm not preaching the law. Every little line does not have a meaning unto itself. No. No. We're rightly dividing the word of truth. We're taking line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, and we're pulling together the larger picture, which is what God's called us to do. We're not supposed to walk in the flesh. We're supposed to walk in the spirit. We're not supposed to see things through natural eyes, but through spiritual eyes. We're not supposed to understand the word of God from a natural, carnal, fleshly, earthly, law-influenced perspective. No, we're supposed to understand it from a faith, grace perspective. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things. Listen. Yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Those who most resist our message are those who insist upon keeping the law alive. They yet preach its mandates and declare that these mandates are binding upon men's hearts and lives, even today in the New Testament era. They refuse to let the first husband die so that they might be married to another, that is, to Christ. But in their zeal to continually revive and resurrect the law, they fall into an adulterous state. And Christ will be no one's concubine. Nor will grace live in a polygamous marriage alongside of the law. As long as the law remains alive, we are not free to be joined to the Lord. And without faith, salvation is unavailable to us. As its promise is inextricably attached to and reliant upon faith and faith alone. Hallelujah. Ours is by no means a new message, folks. The message you hear preached in this church is by no means a new message, but rather it is a corrected perspective. It does not require that we rewrite any single verse of God's sacred text, but rather that we learn to read it from the perspective of grace through faith and not of deeds through the law.
We must, by the Spirit, learn to see all things from a spiritual place, a faith perspective, so that we might walk that path in the Spirit, and in so doing, enjoy the rest that is life in Christ, married and forever bound to the glorious God of our salvation, a God of love and grace. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but my husband is sufficient for me. I'm not interested in going out and committing adultery. I'm not interested in stepping out on my spouse. God, I, my God is good enough. I don't, I'm not looking for another God. Hallelujah. And I'm certainly not looking to revive the old law because the law couldn't do what I need done. Hallelujah. It may have been lovely. It may have been wonderful. It may have caused Moses' face to shine. But honey, it could not do what I needed it to do. Amen. But thank you, Lord. Jesus can. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. All right.